Amen. Looking back here to the book of 2 Peter, I want to just sort of review by way of introduction what we talked about last week. We said that this letter or this epistle uh, was written by Peter from prison to the believers in the five regions, the same five regions uh, that he addressed in his first letter or first epistle. Uh, the difference, once again, as we learned last Wednesday night, is that in his first epistle, he was a free man when he was writing. And he was writing to these people because they had been scattered. They had been uh, persecuted and had to leave Jerusalem and had to leave the region of Judea and ultimately settle in these different regions of the world. Now he is writing to them and he is in prison and he is awaiting execution. So really, these are some of the last words of Peter. And he's writing to these folks this second letter. The, we learned that uh, this letter is focused on teaching these believers to combat and to conquer false teachers and their teachings. In 2 Peter chapter number 2 verses 1 through 3, he addresses the fact that there are false teachers uh, that are everywhere. There were false prophets in the Old Testament, and that there were false teachers uh, living during his time, and that there would be false teachers that would come into this church or come into these churches and ultimately try to render them useless, being tools of the devil or being used by Satan to hinder the work of God. And so the emphasis is on not only combating these false teachings, but conquering these false teachings. And remember we learned last Wednesday evening that you and I and these believers, that all of us could uh, combat and conquer false teachings through knowledge, knowing the Word of God, knowing the Scriptures. And remember, it's knowledge that manifests the promises, the power, and the peace of God to man, as we saw in this very first chapter, verses 2, 3, and 4. Uh, it's through the knowledge of God, it's through His Scriptures that we are told His promises, that we are told about His power, and that we ultimately receive the peace that He promises to us. And as Christians, we continue to look to the Scriptures. We look to the Scriptures as a lost person uh, for direction in salvation, and now we continue to look to the Scriptures and should continue to increase our knowledge of the scriptures. Why? So that we will continue to know the promises of God, know the power of God, and know the peace of God as his children as we go through this life. Now, we also learned last week that Peter instructed these believers to add to their faith as we talked about being fruitful in knowledge. And this covered verses 5 through 8. And he said that they were to add to their faith, that faith is where it all starts. Faith is uh, the root of it uh, all, so to speak, as far as a Christian is concerned. It's by faith that we were born into the family of God, but that's not where we stop in our Christian life. We need to grow the way that a, a baby grows and, and goes through different stages until it reaches adulthood. And so he says, add to your faith. Notice in verse number five that he said to add virtue and to add knowledge. And remember, virtue is good works or morality. So he says, add good works to your faith. <clears throat> Don't be a person that just says, oh, I believe God, and I believe in God, and I believe that the Bible is the Word of God, but you live a, a life that is ungodly. He says, add to that faith good works. Actually, live a good life. Try to be a moral person. Once again, we understand good works do not save us. We understand that good works do not keep our salvation. Our salvation is secure in the hand of God. But good works are important for those that are out there around us because they look at our life. They need to see a Christian who doesn't just say they believe the Bible, who doesn't just say they believe that God is their Heavenly Father, but lives accordingly. And knowledge, remember, because knowledge is the emphasis of this letter, Knowledge here is more than just what, what the world talks about. It's more than just what the world promotes, which is facts. Knowing a lot up here and having all of these facts, it's actually having the right perception. <clears throat> you and I need to increase our knowledge of the Word of God, increase our knowledge of God. 
The more we know about Him, the more we'll know how to live for Him, how to live virtuously. The more that we know about His Word, the more that we'll be able to live a life that is directed by principles from God's Word and not emotions of our flesh. Then in verse number 6, he said to add three more things. He says to add temperance, which we know is spirit, a spirit control or a yielding to the Spirit. Add patience, and we understand what it means to be patient, though we may all battle with that. And then godliness. And remember, godliness is talking about a reverence for God. <clears throat> there are those out there who have faith, but they don't have a reverence for God. Uh, reverence is, is that mindset, it's that motivation for why you live virtuously. Uh, you know, a lot of people live virtuously or try to live virtuously or uh, live a, a life of good works because they believe it's part of their salvation. There are many people that try to live virtuously because uh, their religion teaches that they should do so and maybe their position in a church uh, uh, requires that they do so. And that's not the right motivation. The right motivation for being virtuous, living godly or morally, is that godliness, that reverence for God and who He is. And then in verse number 7, he said, add two more things, brotherly kindness and charity. Remember, brotherly kindness is talking about your relationship with those that are Christians, your relationship with your brothers and sisters in Christ. And then charity is your relationship with the rest of the world. Having the charity or the love that God had and has for the world. So these are the things he says to add to faith. And if a person will add these things, if a believer, I should say, will add these things to his or to her faith, they will, as we saw in verse number eight last week, be a fruitful believer. They'll have a fruitful life. They'll be fruitful in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, moving on here to verses nine through 15 tonight, we want to talk about being forgetful in knowledge. So last week was emphasizing being fruitful in knowledge. Tonight, verses 9 through 15 talk about being forgetful in knowledge. Now, when we are saying in knowledge, we're talking about in the knowledge of Jesus Christ as a believer. Remember, the Bible says that one of the parts of the armor of God is the helmet of salvation. It's called the helmet of salvation because when a person knows Jesus Christ as Savior, they know him as Savior. They know it. They have knowledge. They have that assurance. And Satan, of course, wants to attack us in from any angle he can. And that's why it's important that we wear the helmet of salvation, that we have that know-so, that assurance about our salvation. So when we say that a person needs to be fruitful in knowledge, we're saying they need to be fruitful in their Christianity. And when we talk about being forgetful in knowledge, we're talking about being forgetful in Christianity. Now, Let's look at these verses here real quickly, if you would. Starting there at verse number 9, we're going to see three things here, uh, three main things here real quickly this evening. First off, in, in verses 8 and 9, we see the blindness of those who are barren. The blindness of those who are barren. Going back to verse number 8, remember that Peter wrote here, For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, Peter instructed these believers to add these things to their faith so that they would be fruitful. But on the other end of the spectrum, there are believers out there who are not fruitful. Tonight, some of us may even fall into that category. The, the point of, uh, uh, of the message tonight is, is not for me to aim anything directly at you, but for every one of us, myself included, to examine my own life. Not for me to look at brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so and say, well, are they fruitful? No, it's on them to, to look at their own life and say, am I barren? Am I producing any kind of spiritual fruit uh, or am I not? And so just like there are people that are fruitful in their knowledge of Jesus Christ or in their Christianity, there are those that are barren in their Christianity tonight. If you're one of those people, if you look at your life and you say, you know what, honestly, I, I don't have any fruit in my Christianity. Let me challenge you. Stop living a life of barrenness. Stop living a life of unfruitfulness and start being fruitful for the Lord Jesus Christ by doing exactly what Peter said last week. Add to your faith these other things. Now, with that in mind, in verse number nine, Peter goes on to tell us 
that these people who are barren are not just barren or unfruitful. Notice verse 9, but he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. So he says that they are blind as well. And that's where we come up with the blindness of those who are barren. Now, this breaks down into two points real quickly. This blindness that they experience is the reason why they are fruitless. A person, a believer, who is not producing fruit in their life is not producing fruit or is being barren because they are blind. Now, let me stop for a moment here and and make a distinction. Because in the Bible, we're taught that those who are lost are blind. And this is not the blindness that that Peter is talking about. In fact, we don't have time to look at these verses, but in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the Bible talks about those that are lost and how that they're, they've been blinded by the God of this world. And in Luke chapter 4, verse number 18, we're told that one of the responsibilities of, uh, of those who proclaim or preach the gospel is to uh, give sight to them that are blind. All right, so those that are lost are completely blind. When you and I were lost, before we knew Jesus Christ as our Savior, we were completely blind to the things of God, to what truly was spiritual, what truly may have been right and wrong. And it was only through receiving Jesus Christ as our Savior and the Holy Spirit coming to live inside our heart that we were enlightened and that as we spend time in the Word of God every day, walking with God every day, that we continue to be enlightened. But did you know as a believer, you can still be blind? Notice what he says here in verse number 9, but he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off. And someone says, well, preacher, maybe he's talking about people who have never been saved. Continue reading the verse with me, if you would. And hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. So this is talking to believers about the fact that a believer can be blind. A lost person is blind completely. They can't see whatsoever. They have no spiritual discernment. You and I understand that because we were like that before we got saved. But a Christian can be blind as well. It's not the same type of blindness. Notice what he says they're blind towards in verse 9. And cannot see afar off. What do they say a person is if they can't see things that are far away? They're called nearsighted. These are nearsighted Christians. They don't see things far off. They, in that sense, they are blind. They may not be completely blind, but they're blind to the things that are far off. They're focused solely on the things that are right in front of them. They're nearsighted. By the way, those are usually people, Christians, that are living emotional lives. And, that, and once again, in the 21st century, we have a, a Christianity movement that is being pushed right now that is totally emotionally based And people that are being uh, brought up in this type of Christianity and taught this type of Christianity are emotional and they're nearsighted and they don't have that far sight. And so they are partially blind. This blindness causes them to be unfruitful. When you can't see all the way out in front of you, you can only see to a certain extent. It's going to hinder you spiritually. It's going to it would hinder you physically. And so this blindness is the reason why they're fruitless. We're told there in verse number 8 and then right at the beginning of verse number 9. But also we see that this blindness is the result of their forgetfulness. Notice that he said that they cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. This blindness is the result of their forgetfulness because they don't see they or because they are forgetful, they they don't have the same vision. They've forgotten what God has done for them. And ultimately, Satan has sort of put blinders on them as a Christian. Once again, we understand that our enemy hates us. Even before we were saved, he hated us because we're made in the image of God. Then when we get saved, he hates us because we're part of the family of God. So there is no winning on Satan's side. He hates us no matter what. He wants to keep us, now that we're on the God side and we're a part of the family of God, He wants to keep us from being productive. And so He's going to try to limit what we can see. 
He's going to try to get us to be nearsighted Christians. He's going to try to get us to be uh, Christians that are focused on self, that are focused on our world and what's going on in our lives and totally miss the people that are around us that are in need of help. So here we're told that because they forgot what God had done for them, they became blind, and ultimately what the result was is they were unfruitful. If you ever forget what God did for you the day you got saved, you will be rendered by Satan fruitless or barren. When you start to think that you deserve your salvation, if you ever start to think that, then Satan has won the battle in your mind and in your heart. Every day we ought to get up and we ought to think back to the day we trusted Christ as Savior. Whether you trusted Christ as a young person, a teenager, a young adult, or somewhere in in the middle of your life, you need to think back and remember that time and never get over the fact that Jesus Christ saved your soul from hell. And be excited about it every day. And as we've talked about before, if you lose the joy of that salvation, do like David said and say to the Lord, Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Ask God to give it back to you. Because if you forget what God's done for you, then that means that you've already become blinded. And you're not going to be as fruitful for God as He would want you to be. The second thing we see now, looking at verses 10 and 11, we switch to looking at those that are are actually fruitful. So we saw the blindness of those who are barren. But now in verses 10 and 11, we see the entrance of those who are effectual. When we say effectual, that means those that are productive, those that are fruitful. These are the people that Paul, or excuse me, that Peter was uh, uh, trying to encourage these believers to be by adding to their faith. Be productive. Be a fruitful Christian. Be fruitful in the knowledge or in, in your knowledge or in your Christianity. And so he says, those that are unfruitful, they're blind. They're blind because they've forgotten what God's done for them. And those that are productive, they have a promise. Remember back in verse number five, uh, the promises of God, or excuse me, verse number four, the promises of God are made known to us. And he says, you have a promise from God. If you live a life that is productive for Christ, then you have a special entrance. Let's look at this entrance that he's talking about here. Verse number 10. Wherefore, the rather brethren give diligence. Remember that word diligence. We saw it last week. It means like it means to uh, care or heed. Give care to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, when we think of entrance, by the way, this is another one of those verses, adult Sunday school class, that people will take who believe in work salvation and who believe that you can lose your salvation. And they'll point to this verse and they'll say, see, if you work, if you live a a good life, then you'll get an entrance into the everlasting kingdom. And that's totally misinterpreted. That's not what Peter's saying. An entrance is more than just a way into something. An entrance can be how a person enters into something. Think of it this way. Uh, we might say that the entrance to the building is the, front, the two front doors out here by the steps. But at the same time, we could say that tonight as Tristan walked into the church, he made a grand entrance. Now, we're not talking about the two doors that get you into the church. We're talking about how he came into the church auditorium. And that's what he is talking about here when he says, For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That word minister there means to be uh, supplied. An entrance will be supplied to you. A grand entrance. You'll be able to make a grand entrance as a Christian, a believer who has lived a productive life. Let me Let me uh, sort of take you back to a a story that Jesus told during his earthly ministry in Matthew chapter number 25. Remember the story about the three servants and the talents that were given to them. And remember when the master came back and he found out what they had done with the talents. The first two servants had done well with them. The last servant hadn't. And what did he say to the first two servants? Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. That's ultimately a picture, remember, of 
a person who lives a life that is productive, a, a, a life that is honoring to God as they enter into glory, being able to enter with their head held high, and not with their head hanging down low because they're ashamed of how they live this life. You can go and you can stand before the King of kings and the Lord of lords and you can uh, uh, enter into His presence with your head hanging high if you've done everything in your power and beyond your power with His help to live a fruitful Christian life. But if you have chosen to go the opposite way and to live a barren life, a fruitless life, your head will hang low. I think of sports. Those of us that watch sports you see this all the time, especially right now. You've got the World Series going on. And in the middle innings of a baseball game, they'll have these uh, pitchers come out there called middle relievers. They'll come out and they'll pitch for a couple innings. And over the course of the playoffs, I've seen pitchers that came in in the middle innings here. And if they did really good, they would get to the ninth inning and they'd have the closer who comes in and he finishes off the game. And the, the coach might go out there and take the ball from that middle reliever. And that middle reliever, knowing that he did his job, he'll walk off and he'll go to the dugout and everybody will give him five. But if he has done a bad job, he'll hand that ball to the manager and he'll walk off with his head held down low. That's ultimately what Peter's talking about here. As he says, hey, there is a promise to you that are fruitful. A promise to you that are effectual. That you will have a glorious entrance, a grand entrance. You'll be able to raise your head high as you go into the presence of your Lord. Now notice two things about this entrance real quickly. He says this entrance is supplied for those who are sure. Now when we say those who are sure, we're not talking about those uh, that have assurance of their salvation. But notice in verse number 10, he says, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence, give heed or care, to make your calling and election sure. Two things that are, are mentioned in the Gospels about salvation is a calling and an election. Uh, when we talk about calling, uh, remember the Bible tells us that uh, many are called, but few are chosen. God calls all men uh, everywhere to come to Him uh, through His Son, Jesus Christ, and to come to Him for salvation. Everyone has been called, but not everybody has responded. Then we have the word election there. Those of you that have been saved tonight, you've not only been called, but you've been elected. Now, there are those out there that would have you to believe, as we've talked about before, that God, before the beginning of the earth, He, he went and He picked and chose who was going to die and go to hell and who was going to die and go to heaven. That's not what the election, uh, the word election means there, nor does the word predestinate in the Bible mean that as well. That word election, think about it. We have an election coming up. Uh, let's just take uh, the current candidates out of our, the scenario. Let's say we had uh, candidate A and candidate B. We all went in and we, vote, we all voted for candidate B. We elected candidate B. Candidate B still has a choice. They can, after the election is done, say, I'm not interested in serving, but thank you for voting for me. Or they can go ahead and take that vote of confidence, that nomination, accept it, and become the next president of the United States. When the Bible says that we have an election, it means that God cast a vote for you. By the way, He's cast a vote for every person that's ever lived. Just many have turned that election away. They've said, well, thank you, Lord, for casting a vote on my behalf uh, in the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, but I think I'll try to get there on my own. And so they have rejected His offer, but He has uh, uh, called them and He has elected them. So he says, make your call and your election sure. What does that word sure mean? It means uh, uh, complete. <clears throat> make it sure. Make it complete. If you live a life, he says, that is honoring and glorifying to God, is, that is, is sure or is complete uh, for his honor and his glory, then he's got this entrance reserved for you. Notice, secondly, the thing he says about it, because some might be sitting here tonight and say, Ah, preacher, man, the day after I got saved, I messed up. Or you know what? Last week I messed up, and so I guess that grand entrance isn't available to me. Oh, wait one second. Notice the second thing he says here in verse 10. He says this entrance is supplied for those who are steadfast. He says, make your calling and your election sure. In other words, have a, a life that is complete, completely devoted to the one who called you, the one who elected you. And then he says, for if ye do these things, ye shall ne never fall. Now, 
That does not mean that you never make a mistake. If that were the case, then in the book of Proverbs, uh, the, the verse there in the book of Proverbs that's given to us, Proverbs 24, 16, would be uh, crossed out of the Bible where it says, A just man falls seven times and riseth up again. A just man does that. So God's not saying you're not going to mess up, that you're not going to make a mistake. So you sitting here tonight might say, man, I messed up last week. I don't know if this grand entrance is available to me. Oh, no, no. He's not saying that you'll be sinless. He's not saying that you'll be perfect. But he's saying you dedicate your life. You try to uh, honor and glorify God by giving him, uh, giving yourself wholly or completely to him. And this entrance, this grand entrance into his kingdom will be made available to you. If you are sure and you are steadfast. Notice uh, uh, first, or excuse me, second Peter chapter three, verse number 17 there. Look at what it says. Ye therefore, second to the last verse. Uh, in this, this entire letter. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. So God understands we're not going to be perfect. He's not saying you be sinless and this grand entrance is available to you. He's saying, hey, you be complete, be dedicated, uh, uh, give your life to God to honor him and and be steadfast. Now, that doesn't mean that you're not going to mess up, but you're going to remain steadfast. When you fall like the just man, you're going to rise up. You're going to get back in the saddle. You're going to do what's right. You say, preacher, I forgot to read my Bible today. Well, then you get up tomorrow and you read your Bible tomorrow. I I forgot to uh, pray all this week, preacher. Well, then you get up tomorrow and Friday and Saturday and you pray those days. Hey, you fell, but you get back up and you be steadfast. Why? Because God has given a promise that for you, there is a grand entrance. If you'll just be faithful to the end. And then we see a third thing here and we'll close is we see reminders that are given in verses 12 through 15. These reminders of one who was ready. Peter said that he knew his time was coming. He was going to die. He knew that in in verse number 14, he says, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Once again, we know he's in prison. He's awaiting execution. And he says in verses 12 and 13 and verse 15 that he was going to remind these believers. In verse number 12, notice that These reminders were given to motivate them in the present time in which they live. Notice verse 12. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. Of what things? Of the fact that a a barren believer, a Christian who does not bear fruit, is not bearing fruit because they're blind. And they're blind because they've forgotten what God did for them. And that a fruitful believer, uh, one who has added to their faith these various other attributes, has a, this promise that God is going to honor them when they enter into his kingdom. He says, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them. So he's not telling them something they don't know. And then he goes on to say, and be established in the present truth. In other words, they were already doing right. They were already established in the truth. And he says, listen, I know you already know these things. I know you're already living right. But I'm going to give you these reminders tonight because you need them for this present situation. But then you also need them for the future as well. Verse 15. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease, after he died, to have these things always in remembrance. He says, I'm going to do everything in my power to remind you of the fact that a a barren Christian is not blessed and a fruitful Christian finds the favor of God. Why? Because you need it now, believers, in the five regions scattered around. You need it now, but you're going to need it more when I'm gone. Tonight, you might be sitting there and you might be thinking to yourself, you know what? Sometimes when I come to church, I think... I think preacher preaches the same message. He just changes the text and he changes the points. The truth is, is probably a lot of the messages that I preach and any other pastor or preacher or evangelist or missionary preaches probably are pretty much the same. You know why? Because we need reminders all the time. We need reminders for this present battle that we're in, but we need reminders for the future battle of tomorrow and of Friday and of Saturday and of Sunday. Someone says, 
You know, preacher, sometimes it gets old and, and sometimes I'm just looking for something new. Let me encourage you, don't be ha- one of these people that has an itching ear looking for something new. Because the, we know that if it's new, it's not true. Amen? Hey, we need these reminders. Think, think to sports again, if you would, with me for this analogy as we get ready to close. You can take any kind of athlete. You could take a, a baseball player, basketball player, football player, golfer. Not sure if they're an athlete or not. No, I'm just kidding. I like golf. Let's take a golfer because everybody in here has probably at least played miniature golf before, if not real golf. You get up there, and let's, let's take a miniature golf example or illustration. You get up there, you put your ball down, and you're looking at, down there at the hole, and they have some type of odd obstacle course you have to get past to get that ball in the hole, and you, you lo- try to line it up, and you hit it. After you hit it, if, unless you hit a perfect shot and get it right in the hole the first time, you're walking away saying, mm, I lifted my head. Ah, I hit that just, I hit it wrong. Ah, I was aiming the wrong way. And you're constantly correcting yourself. Think about baseball players. If baseball players, uh, they went up to bat and they were perfect every time in their execution, then they would get, they would bat a thousand. But they don't. You know, a good batting average is 300. That means three hits out of 10 times at, at home plate to bat. That doesn't seem very good. But when someone's throwing a 95 mile an hour fastball or an 89 mile an hour curveball, that's pretty good. And you know what? When they walk away because they struck out, they might have a coach over there who's called a batting coach or hitting coach. Isn't it amazing that guys who make millions of dollars hitting a little white ball have a coach? to tell them how to hit? I mean, they know how to hit. They learned in Pee Wees. They learned in Little League. They learned in high school. They learned in college. Yet in the professionals, they still have hitting coaches. Why? Because we all forget to do some of the basic things. And when they walk away after striking out, they might go over to that hitting coach and say, well, what did you see? Well, you know what? You lifted one of your legs before you should have. You turned your hips a little too quick. You took your eye off the ball which is the big reason why a lot of people strike out. And and they'll just go through the fundamentals. You know what? We come to church and we we may hear a lot of the same old things. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And you know why God tells us to come to church and to hear those things? It's because we need it. If we didn't need it, guess what? We would be praying. We'd be reading our Bible. We'd be fasting. We'd be winning souls by the dozens. But we need it because we're in a spiritual battle and our flesh does not give up. And our flesh does not give in in this battle. Our flesh, because it's a tool of Satan, wants to win. And so we need these reminders as much as these people need these reminders. Tonight, as a Christian, you have to decide what do you want to be? Do you want to be fruitful or do you want to be barren? Do you want to see people saved? Or do you really not care? As long as you don't have any problems. Well, if you're a barren Christian, you're going to have a lot of heartache. Trust me. If you're a fruitful Christian, you'll still have heartache. It's still there. But you're not going to be alone as you go through it. And you are going to be fruitful. God promises it. Not only that, one of these days, when you enter into His presence, He'll say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Father, thank You for all that You've done for us and given to us. Lord, I pray that You'd be with us.